एपिसोड 17 विद रुपेंद्र कौर मंगल सुमन वर्सेस हिम व्हाट इज योर प्रोफेशन व्हाट इज माय प्रोफेशन दैट्स रियली इंटरेस्टिंग आई बीन ट्रैवल राइटिंग फॉर द लास्ट 20 इयर्स um i have been involved in the wildlife scene for just about 30 years i've always loved traveling and yeah i'm basically out on my own i love to travel i have been writing for the newspaper a week so column so you are a columnist right you could say that dear listeners welcome to suman versus human Now you can follow Suman vs Human on Facebook and we can have interesting discussions on my podcast. Suman vs Human can be located on Facebook by going to www.facebook.com slash Suman vs Human. The link is in the description. All right. Today we have a fantastic guest on the show. She is Rupender Kaur Mangat from Nairobi, Kenya. Rupender is a very inspiring personality. She is a columnist for many reputed newspapers of Kenya. She is a wildlife lover. She does lot of things for wildlife welfare and she is a writer and she is standing as a role model for the youth of kenya rupender kaur mangat welcome to the show suman versus human thank you very much suman i mean it's a real pleasure to be on a show that's being hosted in india uh, so yeah it's very exciting thank you before we go ahead can i call you rupi of course you can that's what everybody calls me thank you rupi ji we know you are doing lot to the environment and wildlife but before we get into this i want to know more about you through your words well i'm born and raised in kenya and actually in nairobi the capital city of kenya and um it's a very beautiful city and i mean can you imagine 60 years ago that's yeah, i'm now 60 too can you imagine at that time you know with the it, it was called the green city in the sun and it was just beautiful the whole country is beautiful but i grew up uh, with my uh, family very much into taking all visitors out into nairobi national park which is the only national park wildlife park that borders a capital city in the world and wow. we have three ranging lions um black rhino um plains game you know i mean so it was a very enchanted childhood and we traveled a lot as well within the country because my mother it was from kisumu which is on the lake shores of lake victoria which is the largest um freshwater lake in Africa and the second largest in the world. And it is just very enchanted. We didn't need to go to a national park to see wildlife. We saw antelopes, giraffes, even one time a leopard on the road. So, um that's how my childhood was and that's how I was raised. And so growing up, um I, you know, wanted to be I mean, I I went to university um and didn't study anything to do with wildlife or with writing but it was innate it was with in me so after university um you know I got a job with the um, a large touring company um but I always hated being in the office and I hated uh, you know anything to do with nine to five jobs and so on <laughs> and uh, luckily i got fired from a lot of nine to five jobs <laughs> until <laughs> you know <laughs> i got uh, uh you know one of the um uh, uh ceos of wildlife clubs of kenya dr ibrahim ali called me up one day and asked would you like to volunteer for us 
And that's how it happened. He saw an old letter of mine in a file. I must have, I mean, it wasn't old when I say, it must have been about five years old and it was still lying in the file. It's called Kismet. Yeah. And he called me and said, would you like to help us out? And I said, yeah, sure. What do you want me to do? And he said, raise funds. So for a while I did that. But at that point, the magazine, Comba, was, you know, all the projects were sort of dying out because there were no funds. And he was a great fundraiser. So he took over raising funds. Well, I just got more and more involved in the magazine, you know, I mean, um, calling up people in the museum, researchers, looking for articles. And mind you, this is a youth magazine, the only wildlife conservation magazine in Kenya for the youth. And it goes out to over 3,000 schools, both primary and secondary schools in Kenya uh, that are members of Wildlife Clubs of Kenya. And we do three shoes, three shoes a year. So I just got more involved in, um, you know, with a pencil and uh, notebook in my hand, jotting down notes and so on. And so I was there, I went to the University of Wildlife Clubs of Kenya, because that's where I developed my skills in writing, interviewing, uh, putting a magazine together. And then in 1998, I got another call from a newly launched magazine in the uh, called Saturday, uh, which is an insert in the Nation newspaper which is Kenya's main daily. And, you know, he said, do you mind writing for us on something families can do over the weekend? You know, and previous to that, actually, I had written a few articles and saying, would you look at them and, you know, uh, see if you could use them? And they were really about travel in Kenya. So mm -hmm. that's how I got started. You also love traveling the world, right? Yeah, whenever possible, I do. I haven't been out of the country, f well, within East Africa, sure. But um, for the last couple of years, I haven't been out. But prior to that, yeah, I came to India in, uh, when was it, 2011. And that was great. You know, I mean, I've never been to India. And Qatar Airways had just launched its flight from Kenya to Amritsar which as you know I'm a Sikh and so it's the holiest uh, I mean to go to Amritsar and to the Golden Temple Harmandar Sahib which Sikh wouldn't want that <laughs> <laughs> my question mm -hmm. for you is do you uh, see any difference among uh, taking care of wildlife in Kenya and abroad um, you know it's a hard question to answer but let me try. In Kenya and East Africa, we're very endowed with wildlife. And there's a lot being done. There are lots of organizations coming up. There are lots of people that are passionate about environment, wildlife. And so on the positive note, you know, we've got researchers now, scientists that are talking about coexistence that Wildlife cannot be fenced in a in a zoo or a national park. We need, you know, elephants, for example, need to migrate huge distances in search of food and water. And then the rest of the plains game follows. So it's it's an eternal thing. It's been there since the start of, you know, since it's been there forever. It's a natural thing for wildlife to move in search of pasture and water. And as they do that, what they leave behind gets time to regenerate. But if you fence everything in, there's there's no regeneration. You could kill the very ecosystem and wildlife you're trying to protect. Yes. So now it is very common to hear about coexistence. We need to coexist. And how do we do that? We open up corridors, wildlife corridors, um, we try to make it a safer place where both people and wildlife benefit from each other. Um, we've just had a fantastic launch last week, um, launching Dr. Gladys Klema Zikuzoka, who is a gorilla 
crusader from Uganda, which is our neighboring country. And um, we're talking about the mountain gorillas in the mountains of windy, impenetrable forest. These gorillas were only identified in Uganda in 1987. Nobody knew that these gorillas existed there, oh. except for the very people who live on the ground there. But the outside world knew nothing about them, you know. Um, but in the ensuing years, these gorillas were, um, you know, being poached. There was habitat destruction. I'm not necessarily poached for meat or anything, but they were being caught in snares, being laid out for smaller animals, you know, for meat. Or even, unfortunately, at some point earlier, or not at the present time, but there's the illegal trade in wildlife exotic pets for the circuses and the zoos, you know. Um, but since she's been on the ground, um she is, by the way, Uganda's first wildlife vet. Wow. So it's such an honor that we had her here last week launching her book, Walking with Gorillas. But here's the thing. If the gorillas are to survive, they are dependent or we have to coexist, both of us, the, the humans and the gorillas. So there are lots of community projects around the gorillas wildlife park, which is called Windy Impenetrable Forest. And the the communities there are benefiting from the gorillas now because, you know, through her NGO, which is called Conservation Through Public Health, she has um, a medical facilities up there. Uh, the farmers are growing coffee. There's fair trade. They're getting good prices for their coffee. They're getting good health care services. Um, I mean, there's tons of work happening there. And because of that, the mountain gorilla is, their numbers are increasing. And that's the only gorilla species that is now downlisted from being critically and from being listed as critically endangered to now just endangered because the numbers are increasing. What makes Kenya special when it comes to animal welfare? What makes Kenya special is because we have so many people passionate about wildlife. I mean, for example, through Wildlife Clubs of Kenya, where, uh, you know, we have, what, over 3,000 schools that are members of WCK. At a ground level, we have something like 300,000 children or 400,000 children who pass through our hands, who are, you know, becoming more aware of wildlife and what it takes to conserve wildlife. We have the Kenya Wildlife Service, which is a uh, uh, parastatal government affiliated in charge of the country's wildlife. We have conservancies, wildlife conservancies opening up, which are actually, which belong, the land belongs to the communities, but they are partnering with um, business partners to set up lodges on their, on their land and, you know, giving up certain percent of their land while at the same time they can keep their um, livestock and these are beautiful conservancies uh, um, you, you know I mean they're stunning so what makes us special we've got the big five we have lions elephant rhino leopard buffalo and all the other smaller species we've got you know, at the coastline, our coastline is more than 500 kilometers long. Oh. I mean, and now we know that we have migrating whales, the humpback whale, the whale sharks, um, turtles, and many other species that are on our shoreline or pass through our shoreline. So there's a lot of uh, research going on. And that's exciting, you know. That, that what I notice is Kenya is uh, trying its best to protect uh, wildlife, the basic rights of wildlife, right? Absolutely, that they need space. They need, uh, they, they need space, and they need to be safe. Yes. So yes, and that can happen when you have communities who want that. 
because and the law, the law is also strict. very strict about it yes then getting increasingly stricter you know i mean um but you got to understand yeah it is it is strict you can't you can't shoot anything you can't kill anything out and and penalties are very very strict i mean you got to understand as well that you know 75% of our wildlife is actually found outside of national park outside of protected area and how do you look after that 75% it's with communities if the communities want them they'll survive and they have to the people have to benefit from this wildlife as well so that's where i say it's coexistent how do i get benefited by this cruel oh. wildlife like lions and leopards because they are they are dangerous to the mankind right no 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 they're not dangerous <laughs> <laughs> that's a mistake well, because th- that that is what uh, we were been you know watching in the movies all the time no no a lion or a leopard or any wildlife will only attack when they feel threatened okay you know they have senses like us and unfortunately we've always thought of wildlife as as mindless that they are just animals but no animal wants to waste its energy on running after you or killing you if there's no need to in some cases you know uh, old an old lion will kill an easy prey because it doesn't have teeth and if there's something within reach that it can get to it'll go for it but that's a rare rare incident they don't want to chase after us believe me they they're more frightened of people than we are of them i'll tell you incidences i was in tanzania one time and i was uh, in i was sleeping in a tent and it was a moonlight and i thought oh, i'm not going to close the canvas i'll just zip down the screen and i was sleeping on a bed next to nearest the screen which is like about 2 feet away mm-hmm. and then in the middle of the night there was a lot of roaring and so on and i thought i better open my eyes and see what it is and it was a lioness on my porch oh with two cubs the cubs actually had jumped on it first and they were playing around and my brother was in the next tent watching all this and you know she just kept a soft fur and i was motionless i did not move you're but not scared after, well of course i was scared i mean but i did not move mm mm-hmm. I did not in any way appear threatening to her. And she just kept a low growl, a low purr. You know, and her and her cubs played, they knocked off the uh patio furniture, the table and the chairs and everything. And then finally she gave a loud a loud like a warning, like come on children, it's time to go. Oh. And they vanished in the night. Wow. And that's not the only incidents I've had. One time I was sitting in the car ready to get out and my friends were outside the car and they'd left the window slightly open and I thought nothing could enter and these two big baboons came through oh. and they sat skin to skin next to me in the back seat of course I, I was terrified but oh. again I did not move and they looked in the basket for food they found nothing on bay went out through the window and believe me one snap of their jaw could have taken off my arm or anything i mean they are but as long as you are not threatening as long as you keep still as long as you are not in the way between the baby or the food they will leave you alone but when you panic and try to do something they feel threatened and they will something can happen who knows and sometimes it's unfortunate you know i mean people sometimes are just doing their work and you know um walking or something and they suddenly see the elephant or the buffalo and it's happened it happens in our country all the time and they'll panic and they'll tr- run and the minute you do that they'll run after you so again going back to gorillas somebody asked dr gladys you know walking with gorillas why the title walking I said well yeah it's better to walk with them because when you try to run away from them or run they can run you faster than you and if they mm. feel threatened you haven't got a chance unfortunately in india wildlife is not really well protected 
market because uh, as you know cheetahs were no longer seen in india now cheetahs are not available yeah. in india and recently our prime minister have imported few cheetahs from uh, africa unfortunately uh, uh, many of them were already killed a uh, few were killed uh, naturally and few uh, few deaths are not still reported so i think we indians have to learn so much from africa how sad is that you know why it's so doubly sad is that india is the country that gave the cheetah its name chitra yeah. the spotted one yes and there the last cheetah seen in india was in the 1940 hmm. and then again you know when i say that we think of animals being mindless it's it it was not the right move for the indian government to come to africa and take some cheetahs because your subspecies was a different to our subspecies your cheetahs were different from ours um number 1 number 2 the habitat you know our habitat is different from yours yes so again it's a, it's like taking say for example even me when i went to india in 2011 i had never experienced heat like that because our country has the world's best climate so you know you take you take one animal out and plonk it into another space it, it, you it doesn't make sense anymore we we're much more aware about animal rights these days so i'm even surprised that the indian government chose to take or even the people whoever they communicated with agreed to give the cheetahs it's not in this day and age it should not be a done thing yes how about mankind in kenya how about people welfare how government is looking after basic uh, human rights in kenya because we all know uh, animals are pretty well taken care of. but how about mankind yeah i mean people humans as well we have a great education system we're a middle middle income country um we have facilities in uh, almost the whole country healthcare is there uh we may not be as rich as you know america but we have the basic welfare in the country and on top of that um we also have what we call compensation for human wildlife conflict so people are compensated in various degrees if somebody loses his or her life the family does benefit from the government if crops are raided by wildlife this provision for that so there is that in kenya and in a lot of african countries today rupi you have acquired a rare spine disease called seringomelia and despite of that a spine related problems you have achieved so much in your life and you have done so much to the community and you stood tall as an inspiration for a lot of uh, people in kenya so when did you acquire this spine disease well i was diagnosed in my early teens about when i was about 13 14 years ago and um you know at first it was thought to be multiple sclerosis because the very early stages were very fast i mean you know and and rightly so everybody was very concerned um but um you know i had great role models in my life um you know told me that you have to you know you cut iron with iron and luckily i always loved swimming and being active so i just kept swimming and then i was um you know i went for surgery i was put on lots of medication i was you know even had um uh, two surgeries on on the base of my spine and brain and you know i was also on steroids and and you know in my early 20s i decided i was not going to go that route this was too much i just keep active swimming walking and so on and let life take its course 
and I've been very lucky so far. Um, I've been good. Um, you know, and, and I live in a very beautiful country that has the best climate. It's always, you know, uh, the tropical, it's warm, it's, uh, we have a lot of space. I walk a lot, only that, sorry, at this point, I <laughs> fractured my leg. It was a freak accident. It was totally a freak sorry. accident. But I'm on the mend. And, you know, I got to say, your brother, Kira, is yes. my orthopedic surgeon. I have been very fortunate to meet him. And, uh, yeah, we're very good friends. How about uh, your parents and friends, family's reaction when you have actually acquired this problem? Well, they've been very cool about it. I don't think there's been any drama. We are all aware of the circumstances that it is a degenerative condition, but, you know, no two people have the same symptoms. And um, for many years, it was static. Nothing was, nothing progressed. When I had the surgeries, you know, the uh, the blockages went away. Um, but, you know, come on, I'm now six, over 60, so I'm still living a good life. I I may not be as perfect as a perfectly perfect person, but I still have a great life. It was a painful condition, right? Well, you do go through periods of pain, yes. And, um, you know, it can be very painful for some people. But again, luckily, you know, I've uh, always kept myself active, uh, always done a lot of stretches, yoga, breathing, um, been to the gym, you know, swim. So, yeah, if you keep yourself active, the pain can subside. Have you ever gone through the phase of depression? Uh, well, you know, depression is part of life, but I don't let it get in my way. Yeah, we all sometimes feel depressed. We all feel like life. What is this life? But, you know, you got to look at the bigger picture. Do you want to go that route and fall? Because when you fall, to get up is very hard and you're the only person in charge of your life. That I think everybody should know. So you got to do what you can do the best for yourself. Because when you fall, everybody around you also feels depressed. You, you make other people go down. You don't want that. There is one question coming up next and uh, you have no option to say no. You have to answer this, Rupi. <laughs> now, if you have all the superpower in your hand to change something in Africa, what that would be? Oh, that would be that we coexist. There's enough space for everybody, for wildlife and us. You know, instead of us going into their spaces and then blaming the wildlife for creating problems when we're the ones who are creating the problems. Again, I'll take you back to Dr. Gladys, uh, the gorilla lady. You know, I mean, one of her things up in the mountains is work, when she's working with the communities, one of the projects is on family planning. And a lot of people don't like to talk about family planning. Like we can have as many children as we want, you know, but now the women are in control of their health. They're the ones who are deciding how many children they want. You know, it's no point having so many children and then wondering why you can't feed them. So it's a great project. And with that, the space, the, the demand on the land is not so much. So, um, you know, and, and the land that's lying idle the project is buying that land and reforesting it for the gorillas. So there's less need for the gorillas to come out of the forest and onto their farms. So it's like getting people on your side to understand also about animals. Like you said, you know, previously that lions and leopards are dangerous, cruel, but they're not. They're only living in the space that they are comfortable with. But once we start going in and threatening and they feel threatened, then it's like us. When we feel threatened, we react in a different way. Sometimes even violently. My dear listeners, uh, this was uh, Rupi. And uh, as she mentioned, 
protecting wildlife is a kind of must because as we have already noticed in India, India have almost converted itself into concrete shingle. Sadly, in India, we do not see much of the soil. The, the roads are all made up of cement. And it's very unfortunate that the crude soil is missing and deforestation is leading to animal deaths. And remember, human is also from animal. So just imagine the world without animals. So soon that will definitely lead to no life on the planet. So always care for animals and protect animals and pay respect to the basic animal rights. You put it very, very nicely. Thank you. It was lovely talking to you, Rupi. Thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to bring you on my show, Suman vs. Human. My pleasure. And it was, like I said, a great pleasure to talk to somebody from India. Thank you. Protecting wildlife is our basic responsibility. So, my dear listeners, please give it a thought and kindly contribute whatever you can through the link given in the description. Whatever donations you are offering will be going to the Wildlife Clubs of Kenya for Animal Welfare. 